place where not only did I not know the world, I didn't even know myself. I didn't even know my own voice. And I wonder how many people, they got degrees, they got accolades, they got success as the world would count it, but they lost their voice. Committed to getting in something that they said that they would change. I'm going to change my environment. I'm going to change the world. And then they got there and it changed them. And I just come really to share from the depth of my experience. I'm not losing yourself in the race to be something that perhaps you were never created to be. So in my faith tradition, we are taught that it is written that we are not to be conformed to this world. Conformed. Doesn't mean we don't communicate, doesn't mean we don't associate, doesn't mean we don't love, we don't reach out, but we are not to be conformed to the pattern of this world system, but to be transformed. It is so easy to conform. It's so easy to go along and get along and just say, I'm gonna keep my mouth shut and I'm gonna be in this job. I know I hate it, they know I hate it. Everybody around me knows I hate it, but I'm gonna just try to figure it out. It's like every year something else comes up and we're so connected and then we got the headphones on and we're on the subway and we're in our own zone and we're listening to the music and then we go to the office and we turn on the computer and we're plugged in and it's emails and it's Microsoft Outlook and you know, they're buzzing us on all these different IM messages then we come home and then we get a little bit of time, we eat, we're with loved ones, we do whatever, and then before we go to bed, we're scrolling back through to see pictures of people, we're liking them, people we'll never meet, people that some of them don't even like us, but we <laughs> <laughs> and we're connected with everything except for us. I was with my mother the other day, and I almost, I said, yeah, I'm okay. oh no, somebody's called me on my watch. <laughs> we're so connected to everything but us, and I wonder, if, and social media is a great thing, and all these things are wonderful things in their place, but I wonder if we have become an entire society that's plugged into everything out there and nothing in here. Mm -hmm. And so we get older and we go through the rat race of life, but never really connected to who we are. One quick story, and then I'm going to share three things about not conforming, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So when I was young, I grew up in Baltimore. How many people lived in Baltimore before? Okay. All right. I, I hope you had any crabs. I okay. Did you? Oh, my God. Everybody else said the two of you didn't do me. I couldn't not share crabs. Okay. 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 I could not shake that accent. But, um, uh, so, one of my favorite things as a kid to do was go to the circus. I love the circus. You know, now, you know, the... The animal folks got a hold of it and you can't do the circus anymore. But, but before you could do the circus, and you know, I love, because I love over the top stuff. You know, it's, it's the cotton candy, it's the lights, it's the, especially when they had the, the, the um, under the big top. I don't know if y'all ever seen that. That took the circus to a whole nother level. And so, uh, one of the in most interesting things to me was the, was the lion. The lion that would go through the hoops, you know, the lion that had the little hat on, he on a little leash. One case, I swear, I saw the lion, I think it was like one, like a little tricycle. <laughs> and from my vantage point, sitting in the audience, it was like a big cat. We had a cat at home, it was a cat in a circus. <laughs> because it was so, you know, it was, a, it was a little trick thing. And then I had the opportunity to go overseas. I saw a lion in its natural habitat. You have never seen a lion in natural habitat. It is something spectacular to behold. It's the reason why it's called the king of the jungle. The elephant's bigger, the rhino's stronger, the cheetah's faster, but it is the roar of the lion. It makes leaves on the trees shake. And I'm thinking, it's no way, it's no way. What I saw in the circus as a kid is the same thing here. How could one creature be so different based on the environment? 
How do you get a lion to act like a cat and to dumb itself down and do these little tricks? So clear to me. It's because you teach a lion that it's not a lion. And it is conformed to its environment so much it doesn't even know what it is. And it's being controlled by things that it should be controlling. Mm-hmm. Going through the hoops of life. Applause to people that mean it no good. Because <laughs> all applause ain't good applause. Mm-hmm. And what happens is because the lion in captivity was born in captivity, it thinks that what it has known its whole life is right. It thinks that what is normal is right. And I wonder how many of us alliance playing like a cat? Because it's been so normalized. Oh, that's just how my family is. We're told these things at an early age. That's just how it's going to be. And nobody looks like you can do that. Wait, no, you can't get paid doing that. You need to come up with another dream. And we carry all of these things. And we come to a place like Europe. And we come to a place where finally someone believes in our dreams and believes in our visions. And they're pushing us and they're, they're teaching us and they're training us. But because we have held on to the conformity of the past, we're still trying to fit somewhere we never should be. So three things about how do we not come forward? Because it's easy to say, but, but how do we really come to this place? The first thing is, know who you are. Now I'm not you know, the biggest fan of uh, Shakespeare. I don't know too much about you know, Romeo and Juliet and all this, but I'll tell you this. One thing he said that I appreciate, to your own self, be true. I wish I could pretend as if I had this going on my whole life. I'm 34. If I knew this at 25, I would have missed a lot of dark places in my life. Because it's, it's, it's so easy to just really not know who you are. Oh, you know who you are. You, are. you know what people want you to be. How, how many people in here first generation? Let's say going to college, for instance. Okay. I won't even ask you to raise your hand. First generation may be breaking the cycle of criminalization or doing something else in your family. And that's a good thing, but sometimes what happens is people put these dreams on you. And it, and can I be honest? It was not even meant for you. And so how do we become to know? are. One way is to know what you're not. The first job I had at a law firm, I remember, I don't know, a lot of people say corporate law. You know, they said, you know, it's, it sucks your soul and all this other stuff. I was like, yeah, yeah, right. When I did the interview and they said, you'll get paid $3,100 a week, I said, okay, you said a week? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to love it. Love it already. I'm going to figure this thing out. I remember I'm, 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 in the, I'm in it and it's just like I can't, this, I can't do it I was trying and I did it for three different summers because I figured if I changed firms and moved cities that that feeling of emptiness would go away you have to pay attention to when you know you don't fit something I have one partner really successful phenomenal woman she comes to me and she says, you know, Daryl, you're charismatic and people like you, but none of that matters here. It only matters how well you write. And I think she was saying that in one way to encourage me to shift my focus. But in my mind, all she did was confirm to me, that's why I don't belong here. I cannot try to make myself fit somewhere I was not designed to be. Pay attention to, to what you're not. Pay attention to when it, it, you, you just realize it just doesn't feel right. I'm trying, but I can't do it. And, and I, that, that feeling of emptiness, pay attention to that. 
Because it's not that it's something wrong with you. It's that it's something that is locked on the inside of you. That unless and until you get where you're designed to be, you never really fully recognize your potential. So you have to recognize who you are. You got to know who you are. You got to know what you have. I think so many times we focus on skills. And I think skills are good. You know, the first thing they say in the resume, tell me your skills. You know, and you go to the interview, what are your skills? I think skills, skills. But I think there's something a little higher than skills, and that's gifts. See, there are some things that have been downloaded in you that cannot be taught. I mean, they can teach it to some level, but not the way that you have it. What do you have that you have dismissed? Have, have you considered that everything you need, you have? Not everything you want, <laughs> not everything you want, but everything you need on the foundational level to receive the thing that's in your heart and to carry out the dream you already have. I remember when we went to, to Cali, we saw this tree. This tree was so big that it literally was a sequoia tree. You may have seen it on Google. So they cut a hole in it and you could drop a truck. Mm -hmm. It's that big. And can you believe, bless you, bless you, yeah. can you believe that the entire tree came from one seed? Everything that the tree would become is in the seed. Why is it? That no matter if you look at the embryo of an animal or the seed of a tree, every single thing that it would become was contained in the seed. And it's only humans, the only creation on earth that looks everywhere else for what we should know is right inside. What's the gift that you have that, that is going to provide the provision for you to be everything that you have in your heart to be? And, it, and, and it's not that I'm, obviously, I think formal education, degrees and accolades, all that stuff is nice. But if it never gets coupled with an unlocking of the gifts, then we have a lot of skills and a big resume, but we've never tapped into purpose. The relay race. The relay race was actually the most powerful event because it was what they prided themselves on as nations. It wasn't just about individual runners. In fact, in the relay race, it has nothing to do with the runner. And it has everything to do with the team. Now, what's happening here is, and I want you to see this. The, you have the runners on the field, you've got the people in the audience, and then you've got the nations that they are representing. And the point is to get the baton from point A to the end. It's not about the runner. The runner is only there, positioned, to get this from this place to here. The dream that is placed in the hands of the runner isn't even owned by the runner. It's been given for long enough for them to get from this place to here. So what happens is, bring us up here. It's like a relay race. And when you stop, no, come here. You, when you stop, now you go here. Now I want you to stop right here. As the runner, what's your name? Zoe. Zoe. Zoe may never go past this point, but her purpose is what? To get the baton from here to here. So I, I, I explained to you that there is what? There are the runners on the field. There are the people in the audience. There are the nations that are counting on them, that, that they represent. This is the dream that they are carrying. But the question is, how do the people get positioned where they are positioned? It's because it's a coach that we cannot see. A heavenly coach that has positioned each person knowing exactly what their strengths are, exactly what their gifts are, even knowing their struggles. But I still positioned you at this place because I know you're going to be best for the last leg. And I know what you have right here. And you're, you're going to start us off. I need you here. I knew everything that was going to happen. 
I knew it was going to happen in your childhood. I didn't, I didn't condone it, but I knew, and I still positioned you. And what happens is we spend so much time thinking that this is about us. And we, we say, well, I don't feel like it today. And, and I don't know if I can build the business. And if we don't take this to the next thing, then what happens? Nations that are counting on us lose. Frederick Douglass was born a slave. We talk about, we talk about adversity. A slave slave, excuse me, a slave slave. I mean, I just want a whole slave. slave. <laughs> it's not a metaphor. I know people say, I'm working like a slave. No, you are not. <laughs> and he was born. They said that he was beat so bad that at one point he turned to his master and said, either you're going to kill me or I'm going to kill you. And the master was his own father. And he ended his life as being someone who was one of the most prominent people in America. A lot of folks don't know this. I'm coming back to you, but a lot of folks don't know this. He was the first person, first African American, to be nominated for vice president of the United States. It was a third party, and people just knew it was just a point to just, you know, we'll just say you did it. But hey, it was a step. He ran his leg of the race long enough to get the baton to Dr. King, who said, though, though I was not born a slave, this thing was given to me by people who ran before me, who ran this race before me, who died for me to be right here, who, and this man galvanized the nation. Over a hundred countries in the world celebrate Dr. King's birthday. And there's only 200, so you can do the math. And Dr. King said on April 3rd, 1968, I might not see the finish line. I might not get there with you. But we're going to get there. And he handed it off to Barack Obama. So, because I need you to see this, because it's not about you, it's, it's bigger than you. So that someone, it was a joke when they said nominate for vice president, how is that going to work? To now, Someone who's counsel as Dr. King, counsel presidents. And they said, this is a big deal. A black man going into the White House and he's sitting next to the president to now is the president. And his black wife with the cornrows. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say it. I wanna say it. I wanna be <laughs> He may have never seen that. But he knew I had to run this race. And now Barack Obama ran it long enough to bring it to you. And now what happens when you think this is about you? Mm. All of these people ran to hand this thing off to you. And you think that that business that's in your heart and that feeling of emptiness because you're in a job that you're not really feeling and that thing that won't die no matter how many times people ridicule you and you really think it's about you? What would have happened if Dr. King said, I just don't feel like speaking today and you don't even do it. <laughs> <laughs> a whole nation would have been held up and this is what happens. Because we get in our feelings, what's the new word, Reese, in our bag? Isn't that the new word? <laughs> We get in our bag, we take the baton, and we go home, and there's runners that never even got to run. Because it doesn't matter how fast you are in the relay if the baton never gets to you. 